right, assalamu alaikum. Um, we are about to get started. Audhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Arrahmani rahim. Maliki yawm al-deen. Iyak na'abudu wa iyak nasa'in. Ihdina surata mustaqeem. Surata al-lazina anamta alayhim. Ghayra maghdubi alayhim al-dualeen. Ameen. So Mujahid, we are starting with you in chapter 25, or 23, sorry, 23. Okay, Jazakallah Khairan, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Welcome to another uh, bi-monthly uh, meeting with the Embrace Minnesota chapter. Um, we are here today to discuss a chapter about the Sahabi, the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this companion's name is Spice Ibn Saad Ibn Ubada. And, uh, Ibn Sa'd means he's the son of Sa'd, and Sa'd was the Ibn Ubadah, which means Sa'd was the son of Ubadah. So Qais is his first name, son of Sa'd, son of Ubadah. And after that, we're going to have Sister Shannon share the uh, chapter on Miriam, inshallah, the mother of the Prophet Jesus, alayhi salam. Um, so thank you so much, inshallah, bismillah. So this guy, Qais Ibn Sa'd, I'm just going to call him Qais from now on, Q-A-I-S, Qais. Um, he was a young man, and as you see here, they said if only if only we could buy him a beard. Um, basically, he was young; he didn't have a beard, but he's respected for for his character. And uh, they they used to joke about him, you know, like you know, if only we could get him to have a beard somehow, he'd be a true leader because without his beard, he looks kind of young. Um, but that's okay; he was really he was really. Uh, honorable as it says here he was um very gen generous and that's also part of his family tradition that everybody knew that his family was known for his, for their generosity um but before brother kais became a muslim he was known as being a very crafty man meaning he was clever you know like he was very uh, like uh, slick spoken you know he could he could fool people very easily so I don't know, the book doesn't go into details, but I imagine that like transactions, uh, you know, trading, bartering or whatever it is, he uses craftiness to outwit all the Arabs. So the book doesn't go into detail besides that, but you can assume like maybe he's ripping people off, you know, when he's trading with them or convincing them to buy something that was actually broken. I mean, I don't really know for sure. So we just have to leave it at that, that he was uh, crafty and slick and, you know, sharp-witted, trickly, resourceful, that kind of thing. But when he became Muslim, he, uh, he turned away from all that. And he did not, he was no longer known for being like a person who would outwit somebody, you know, like fool them, or deceive them in one way or another. Um, he was fierce in battle alongside the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was also fierce in battle after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died. His brother Thais was still known for being very good in the battle in the battle, in the fighting. So um, if we read this here, he, he sat there. Um, so there is a battle um, where Muawiyah was trying to kill Ali. I'm not a scholar on Islamic history, but what I think this is about is after the four, you know, we had four rightly gathered caliphs, the leaders of the Muslims, Umar, Abu Bakr, Uthman, and Ali. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam testified that after his death, there would be four rightly guided, rightly guided caliphs or rightly guided leaders. And after that, that Islamic empire would become a bunch of kingships. So we all know that when a king is a leader, he abuses his authority and he uses it for his own well-being. It's not necessarily 100% for Allah. They might take advantage of it and use it for some power, money, wealth, fame, glory family, that kind of stuff. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that the first four leaders, the first four caliphs, they would uh, be rightly guided, meaning the, the four Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, and uh, what was the other guy's name? Ali. I can't remember. The four. Ali, Uthman, oh. Abu, Bakr. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, yeah, Omar. and Ali. Okay, so I think yep. you're missing so, uh, Omar. Omar, yeah. Thank you, Sister. 
So these are the four rightly gathered caliphs, and uh, there we learn our Islamic religion, not only from the Prophet Muhammad SAW, but also from his companions. And uh, these four rightly gathered caliphs were actually, I think at least two of them were murdered. Um, yeah. Ali being the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad SAW, he was murdered by Muawiyah and his gang. Um, so there is some fighting going on about people who are deciding who wants to be in power, you know, who wants to be in power. And uh, so they plotted against Ali and Ali told them, he said, I don't want you guys to uh, spill bloodshed for the sake of me. And I was listening to a lecture about this a few weeks ago. Hopefully I got the details right. But Ali refused to fight and eventually they killed Ali. So they had thousands of people gathered outside of his home. And there's a gang of Muslims on Ali's side saying that Muawiyah is a bunch of traitors. And Muawiyah was saying Ali has no right to be an authority. But Ali said, I'm not going to raise my sword against another Muslim. You know, don't spill bloodshed on my behalf. Just, just try and calm down, you guys. They ended up killing him eventually. And it says here that uh, this ICE Sahabi, he said, the evil plot encompasses only him who makes it. That's in the Quran, chapter 35, verse 43. And Muawiyah, or uh, Brother Faiz, he used to plot, you know, take advantage of people, uh, craftiness, skillfulness, lying, cheating, deceiving to gain benefit. And he remembered this verse in the Quran that the evil plot of somebody, it, it only takes advantage of the person who made the plot, you know, in some way or another. It's not good to be trying to plot. Surely Allah is the best of plotters. That also says that in the Quran. But if you're trying to plot evil for whatever it is, you might succeed in one way or another. But at the end of the day and in the next life, however it goes about it, Allah is going to make it come back and bite you in behind, essentially. That's what this verse is saying. So the brother Thais knew that ayah. And that's why he changed his entire personality as far as like ripping people off, doing a Trick, trick, trickery, that kind of thing. Um, so Saad, who is Kais's father, is Kais's, Kais ibn Saad, so Kais the son of Saad. Saad submitted himself to Islam and he held his son Kais in his hand and introduced Kais to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa saying, this is your servant from now on. So he gave his son to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when Kais was a young man. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, this place will always be filled by him for the rest of his life. So as you can imagine, that seat next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be upon him, that spot next to him was often filled by Faiz. So Faiz learned a lot about Islam from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi because he was close to him. Um, as it says here, when he embraced Islam, he turned his life and even disposition upside down as it taught him how to treat people with sincerity rather than with deceit. So as you continuously see in all of these uh, Sahaba, mostly, once they converted to Islam, they completely changed their life. And as far as us being converts to Islam, the reverts to Islam, however you like to refer to it, just because, you know, we weren't born Muslim doesn't mean that that, that we can't have like a good iman, you know, strong faith and action and, and knowledge. Because if you look at the very best Muslims, they are all converts. You know, every single one of them converted to Islam and a lot of them drank alcohol. They did all kinds of things. But then after they became Muslim, they became the best Muslims that were ever known. And we should use that as a uh, insight, you know, like encouragement to do that with ourselves. So when we come into Islam, we might have a lot of baggage, like we used to listen to rap music, whatever. That's a story about me. I used to be a rapper. Um, and I'll, whenever time I rap, you know, it's about thugging and stealing and murder and sex and drugs, it's all I rap about. But when I became Muslim, I gave up on that. And uh, now if I tried to rap, I couldn't even do it. I'm, I'd be horrible because I completely got rid of that part of my soul, inshallah, may Allah accept, where I don't have that kind of stuff coming out of my heart anymore, where I can just easily make up rhymes on the fly. So just like this brother Faiz, he, he gave up his baggage. You know, he quit deceiving people and he became sincere. So um, yet wherever he faced a difficult situation, he restrained and thwarted craftiness, tried to rebel and gain control over his actions. 
If it were not for Islam, I would have used my trackness to outwit all the Arabs. He is well known for being slick and smooth, but he changed that when he became Muslim. Um, he is very generous. People used to know that if you were hungry in the area, you could go to the Dulim Ibn Haritha's house for food. Uh, if you need the meat or whatever, if you're hungry, you always go there, you're going to get good food. Um, it was his great grandfather's house. And there his, like I said earlier, his family was known for being very generous. And Qais was also generous in his own generation. Um, so as you know, in Islam, if you've ever seen or met a lot of Muslims, usually they're very, they take a lot of honor and privilege and prestige and, and, and joy in hosting people at their houses or at events. You know, it's a tradition both in the Arab culture and especially in the Muslim culture to uh, be very generous to your guests. And uh, I think in Afghanistan, I heard a scholar one time saying that the best in Afghanistan, they have a saying, uh, the best thing for a new rug is spilt tea. You know, if you get a new rug, you invite people over and they spill the tea in your rug that, you know, you get baraka, you get blessings for that. So instead of like cursing at the guy and kicking him out of your house, you know, you can just say, oh, it's okay, brother, no big deal. You spilled on my new rug. It's all right, you know. Inshallah, stay longer. Let's eat some food, you know, that kind of thing. So when you, uh, you know, you host people at your house, it's blessings come in that. We know that from the Islamic tradition. So this brother Qais was very honorable and like, uh, you know, he took a lot of pride and joy in hosting people and being being nice to them. Um as we continue to move down here to the PDF. Ever since Christ threw aside his incredible skill of being cunning and maneuvering and crafty, he held on to a straightforward and conspicuous courage. He felt relieved and content, notwithstanding the problems he had, confront, he had to confront and the obligations he had to fulfill. So a lot of these Sahaba, they went into battle, they risked their life, they lost their wealth, they spent their wealth for a law, you know, and they, none of this stuff held them back. You know, so being in America as a uh, minority and then being like a convert to so your minority within your own religion as well, um, it can be tough sometimes, but we need to hold strong to our faith and hold strong to our principles. And we need to be brave and uh, righteous as much as possible. And, um, you know, so I think if we really learn about these Sahaba, these companions of the Prophet so Psalm, we can use a lot of these lessons as, as lessons for our own lives and also for encouragement for ourselves. Um, you know, when, type, when things get difficult, uh, we need to just trust in Allah and try our best and then be happy with the outcome, knowing that Allah is the best of planners. And if we do truly, sincerely ask Allah for things and it appears he did not answer our prayer, uh, we can remember that Allah will give us what we asked for or else something even better. So if we didn't get exactly what we asked for, like say I wanted a white Mercedes Benz for my birthday. This is kind of like a joke. And then I got like a Pontiac Grand Am or something for my dad on my 16th birthday or whatever it was. Um, you know, we have to be happy with what we have. Or if you really like on a more serious note, like if you made dua, you supplicated, oh Allah, give me a child. And then you and your husband or you and your wife never had any kids, no matter how much supplication you did to Allah, you have to trust that Allah is giving you something better than that because he is the best of plotters and uh, he listens to your prayers and he's shy not to answer people when they call on him. So we need to have trust that if we didn't appear to get what we asked for, Allah is going to give us something either, even better. So may Allah give us something even better. I mean, and may Allah answer our prayers and always, um, you know, guide us and keep us strong and protect us from ourselves and from the shaitan and from the community, uh, from the enemies and from the fitna, uh, that, you know, like when a masjid divides in two because there's a dispute from the board of directors of who gets to be the imam, you know, or when one country divided, divides against another country like Saudi and uh, Yemen, you know, so may Allah protect us from all these types of things and uh, keep us on the straight path, inshallah, I mean, khair. I mean, yeah, I like how you pointed out, um, you know, as we, and we've talked about it before, we're like, everybody is a con like all the Sahaba are converts. Of it. I mean, there's probably a couple of them that were like real young when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died that were like, you know, born Muslims, but like, 
by and large, um, that's what we see. And I remember I was doing a class this last term that was on the um, the four, sometimes there's like a fifth caliph that they put in there because um, he was only, he only ruled for six months, but it like rounded out the 30 years um, exactly that the Prophet said that we would have rightly guided caliphs. But anyways, um, they were talking about Abu Bakr and how he was like upright and everything before Islam. And it's a, there was a saying, the best of people before Islam or the best of people after Islam. And like, as a convert, I almost took issue with that because I'm like, I was not the best of people before Islam. So like, you know, it kind of felt discouraging. And then we talked about it some more and they were saying, you know, like, let's say somebody was smoking before Islam. And like, especially if you start before you're 18, like that sticks with you forever. Like, I, I haven't smoked for over 10 years. But like, you know, it's still for some reason, like, it's not completely gone. Like, I've had opportunity, I've chosen not to, you know, but like, there's still that, you know, when you get stressed, you're like, man, that's, that sounds like a good idea. You choose not to. And he was saying, you know, just even that pull of like old habits, how you were raised, you know, all of those things and like choosing against it can raise you in ranks in another way. So it's, there's so many pathways and so many opportunities to be like a great Muslim, you know? And I think that's, what's really interesting about the companions is like, some of them were really generous. Some of them were really brave. Some of them were really pious. You know, they all kind of took some, one of their talents and like built on that. Yeah, and the, and the, and the difficulty we go through, um, and Allah bless you. So the difficulty we go through, we're trying to be, get rid of our old culture and our old habits. The difficulty we go through, we're trying to read Arabic for the first time and recite the Quran for the first time and have classes like the one we're in right now. You know, we get rewarded for our effort, you know. So if it is difficult, instead of getting discouraged, we should be, you know, excited that, you know, we're, this is a very difficult thing. But because of sacrificing, just like the Sahaba, some of them gave all their money and wealth. You know, mm -hmm. to, to the to, to Allah's cause. So yeah. we do things like that, and it really, uh, you know, there's a lot of potential reward for that from Allah, inshallah. Absolutely. Oh, and I just want to mention, Erica, that um, we are going back in person. I know that, like, I'm home right now. I'm not feeling super well, so I'm like drinking my tea and. Like, I'm sure it's just like a common cold. I am like 99% sure it's a common cold, but because of COVID, I knew that if I'm like sounding hoarse and like drinking tea and stuff that I'd probably make people feel uncomfortable. So yeah, people cool. don't like those symptoms around, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing can just be a common cold nowadays. I know, I know. So that's why I'm home. Um, Alhamdulillah Mujahid uh, came in and we will be in person uh, going forward. So inshallah. we're going to do in person going forward, but we're also going to have it online for people who can't join. But it's recommended and it's available for anybody who wants to meet in person. So we got a conference room, um, I think, at the city of St. Anthony. Um, it's kind of like in, around the northeast area of Minneapolis, I think, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, that's not, yeah, that's it's not close to like Roseville. Know. You said it's not far from you? No, nope, my stepdad lives right over there. We grew up over there, so I know right where that is. Um, and it's good to have the flexibility, too, of the both in person and online, because some like every other weekend I'm working, too, because I'm on call 24 hours a day. So it's so up in the air. But yeah, I like that. I like the opportunity to do both. Perfect. Alhamdulillah. Um, do you have any other comments about the chapter that uh, Mujahid read? I don't. It was interesting in the beginning where they talk about how he doesn't have the beard. And I'm not too familiar with that, but like a lot of my friends have a little beard or no beard. Is it just recommended always that a man wears a beard? You probably dug into that a little bit more than I have, Mujahid. I don't even know for sure, really. I mean... I know, like culturally speaking, you know, it's like 
just if, even if you look at like the people who invent like any of these great inventors like who invented electricity gravity um a philosopher a, a sociologist you know they're always having beards traditionally like except for the last i don't know 50 to 100 years people started shaving but as far as religiously in a religious obligation i don't even know if it's required or whatever i know some of the math have like how if you might have said if you grow it and you have a you can grab it in your fingers like this and the beard is coming out from under your uh palm that's how long it is you can cut it like that right there but once it gets that long you're not supposed to make it shorter it has to stay that long or longer but you can't go beyond you can't go less than what would fit out of the bottom of your palm hmm. but besides that like what about when it's short like mine then can i shave it off i don't really know the ruling on it to tell you the truth to be simple and straightforward and honest. Right. It was just interesting that they actually like talked about, you know, he didn't have a beard, but he was still respected. I think yep. the way that the author wrote it, it seemed like he, my, my perception from what he wrote is that he was making it sound like he almost looked childish, but they still gave him like the respect of like a grown adult. Um, and yeah. from, from what I understand, it is Sunnah. So like, you know, we're, and it's like, there's sunnah of like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam having long hair and having short hair. So like, there's some things where like, both of them are fine. From what I understand, he always had the long beard. And um, when I'm thinking of all the reasoning that I've been told, <clears throat> when I first came to Islam, um, most of the advice that I was taking in was from like, an extremely conservative um, uh, angle of things. So now I'm like, you know, now that I'm like getting more of an education, I'm sifting through some of that and like, okay, yes, this was accurate. And no, this was like, not super accurate. Um, Cause, and this is kind of just like a side note. A lot of people that I've seen that have like come through that angle of like super, super conservative um and granted i still kind of lean on the conservative side of things but um you know just really harsh and uh my way or the highway type thinking most of the people that i knew that were in that in that realm have left islam like they weren't able to keep it up so i hesitate in like sharing things that i learned from then from back then and like that i haven't double checked on and it's just not really in my level of interest to check on the beard, you know, like it's not immediately relevant to me personally. Um, right. So, yeah. So, well, there's always room, you know. Um, same thing like hijab, like we know that women should be wearing that. Um, there's obviously, it's pretty common sense. It's not as vague as like a beard. But if a sister becomes Muslim and she doesn't wear her job, that doesn't mean she's not a Muslim. Same thing if a guy doesn't doesn't want to grow his beard. He's, he wants to look business professional. He works at a bank. He wants to keep clean shaving. Um, you know, it doesn't take him out of Islam just because he has one weak spot. So even if it was required, it doesn't mean like you have to do it. Otherwise, you can't say you're a Muslim anymore. You know, you, you, you can pretty much do almost anything, but you have to ask a lot to forgive you and try your best and be sincere about it. You know, yep, and, I get and that, Allah is no, a judge. I'm, I'm, I do get that feeling from people as well. Like, oh my God, you're not doing that. Then how do you call yourself Muslim? You know, like, so I do, I do get that side of it too. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen like people born and raised Muslim. They got all kinds of makeup on, no hijab or a party like with 200 people, Muslims, men, Muslim women, children. And some yeah. guy's wife is wearing a bunch of makeup and no hijab, but because she's born and raised a Muslim, nobody wants to question her iman. You know, she still gets to be a Muslim. But then if a converted or reverted sister doesn't wear a job, it's like, oh, she's a phony, man. She's not she's not Muslim. She don't wear a job. And it's it's, a, it's it's really not fair. Yeah, where it really gets problematic is um, you know, like haram is a really, really strong word. And there's very few things, you know, in like the whole spectrum of life that are really truly haram. So like to not wear hijab is problematic but like what's what would take you out of islam is to say hijab is not a part of islam 
you know so like when people are like oh you're not a muslim because you don't do this or you're not a muslim because you drink or you're not a muslim because you smoke the issue would be more saying it's okay for me to drink while i'm muslim so you're basically taking the evidence that allah has given us like you're taking allah's words and you're saying that's not real that's what like would actually bring somebody outside of the level of islam whereas if somebody's like you know, I know that I do this, but I recognize that I'm not supposed to do it. And so I'm asking for forgiveness and I'm like trying to, I'm working toward not doing it or I'm working toward doing it, however that, however that is, that's, you know, that's somebody's journey. That's what they're working on. Um, but yeah, yeah. I totally get it from that yeah. point of view. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like if somebody is not able to pray five times a day because their faith is weak or whatever, and then they come on and say, well, you know, I'm so strong in my faith. I don't even have to pray because praying is for the weak people of weak faith and they're far from Allah. So they need to pray to get close, but I'm already close to Allah. So, you know, praying five times a day, I don't have to do that because I, I, I make zikr even in my sleep, you know, like it sounds like some uh, extreme Sufi might say, you know, that that takes them outside of Islam, mm -hmm. like Sister Shannon said, because they're refuting you know, something that's clear. Same thing, like if somebody said, well, you know, in this day and age, you know, we have, you know, medicine for STD so I can sleep around or whatever because we have medicine or whatever. It doesn't make any sense. If you say something like that, then you're, then you're negating, you're outside the bounds of Islam. But if you went and said, well, you know, I have a problem with alcohol, may Allah forgive me and you repent and you sincerely ask Allah to forgive you and you sincerely try, then technically you're still Muslim. Same thing with the hijab or the beard. Yeah. Okay, yep. All right, we can get started with Maryam. I won't, you know, there's not a lot in the Quran or even the Bible really. Um, when you look at big characters in in the Abrahamic faiths, well, specifically Christianity and Islam. You know, we talk a lot about Mary, um, alayhi salam, but like, or I don't know, what's the proper for Mary? Like, she's not a prophet, radiallahu anha. Um, so like, we talk a lot, a lot about her, but her, stare, her story is very brief. Um, in the Quran and just, you know, to kind of review. So we're like all on the same page. She was born to parents that vowed to dedicate her um, to the temple. Cause you remember Christianity didn't like, Christianity was like after Isa alayhi salam, um, you know, even Isa alayhi salam was uh, a Jew. So their dua that they were making, they're expecting that like, if I make this dua, that I'm going to dedicate my child to the temple, then I'm going to have a son who can be a rabbi, who can be, you know, a leader in the temple. So, you know, from the story that we read, it seems like they were quite sure, like I made this dua, so like, this is a sincere dua, so I'm gonna get exactly what I was thinking of. So they were very surprised when they, when they had a girl. Um, they still dedicated her to the temple in a way that, you know, I'm not exactly sure how that looked, but what it sounds like is that Mary lived at the temple and was taken care of there. And, you know, I imagine that she did all that she was allowed to do, you know, as a female in the temple. Um, so, you know, the Christian writings say that she was brought up there until about age 12. Um, as we know, like, I mean, there's still uh communities in the world today that don't mark down birth dates so this is like 2000 years ago so obviously whether she's 12 14 16 10 whatever all of this is pretty uh in flux in terms of like our understanding but um until puberty obviously and then um you know she was given the news of a miraculous pregnancy we always say miraculous birth which I feel like it's a little bit off the mark because as far as I understand, she went through all of pregnancy. And so you are this young girl who, you know, is living in a temple who has been living there this whole time, very, like very sheltered from, from what I'm gathering from this. And I, I'm filling in a couple blanks here just based on my assumptions of what this looks like. 
Um, but I assume if you're living at the temple, you're living a pretty sheltered life. Um, and then she has to go through like all the stages of pregnancy. So then she gives birth to Isa alayhi salam. Um, through Islamic texts, we hear that, you know, while she was um, in labor, you know, she's kind of in the throes of labor and like wishing to die, which if you've ever had a kid, you understand exactly <laughs> that moment where you're like, I would rather die than keep going through this. Um, and she was told to like grip onto a, a date tree, you know, which is very, very sturdy and kind of like brace herself and like shake the date tree to get some dates down for some nourishment. Um, so this, this is the one part of the story that is extremely different from the biblical story. Of course, the biblical story is she has um, a husband named Joseph, which I've always been quite confused, like where he ever came from and whatever, but um, and he gives birth, she gives birth in this manger and so on and so forth. So that's one thing where like the Quran story and the biblical story are extremely different. There is no Joseph. There's, she's alone. She's giving birth alone. Um, and you can only imagine um, what that feels like. I've actually known somebody personally that gave birth alone. Uh, she was, so other than the immaculate pregnancy, um it was very similar where she was she was young um and her parents actually didn't know that she was pregnant and so like when her mom was at work she gave birth at their house um and called her mom on a payphone and was like i had a baby so but she described some of like the things she was thinking of as she's like giving birth alone nobody knows she's in labor Nobody knows she's even pregnant. Um, and just all of those thoughts that are kind of going through, she might've been 15 or 16, uh, all the thoughts that were kind of going through her head. So I guess I'm imposing some of that <clears throat> understanding into the story, but you know, it's kind of a universal experience. So after he was born, she kind of, she comes out into the community. She knows what people are gonna say. Um, and of course people are saying those exact things this was not a miracle she just hid things she's being a liar she's being deceitful um and she didn't know what to say so she just points to isa alayhi salam who's like they say he's in a cradle it's so funny it's like up until this very moment every time i imagine it imagine the story in my head i've always imagined her like pushing a stroller which i guess like two thousand years ago probably was not happening but However, you know, he was, um, uh, you know, in some kind of transportable device. He, you know, she points to him, uh, alayhi salam, and he speaks, he speaks on her behalf. And he, you know, um, confirms her chastity and confirms the miracle of this birth, of this pregnancy. Um, because of course it is a miracle that he is even speaking in the first place. So I guess, you know, a lot of these things I think we kind of knew of ahead of time. This chapter is really short. So I guess I wanted to kind of like think about some of the things that we can gain from knowing this story, right? Because there's like, there's the facts on the piece of paper that we can know and that there's value in that, of course. But then like, especially these stories, Allah has told us these stories for a reason. And so like, what are the things that we can learn from these stories? So a couple things. So there's the dua of the parents of Mary alayhi salam, or already Allahu anha. I need to like look into what's proper to say for Mary. Um, excuse me. And the patience that they had through this process when they're making this dua, they're so sure that their du'a is going to be answered in the way that they expect it to be answered because they're so sincere. And then I'm sure that there was just like some disappointment in there where they had to like recalibrate their expectations, recalibrate what they're going to do, like what's the next step now? Because they're think, you know, like all of us have done this. We're like, I'm going to do X, you know, or like even just having a kid. Okay, we're going to go to the hospital. She's going to have the baby. We're going to come home. The baby's going to sleep here you know um mother-in-law is going to come and stay with us so for them they had to like really switch gears of what they were going to do but they kept they kept their promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that process even though they likely felt 
Like their du'a was not really being answered. And then I don't know if they lived long enough to um, to know of Mary um, being pregnant and having Isa alayhi salam and then seeing that Isa alayhi salam was going to be a prophet, like one of the greatest prophets. I don't know if they lived to see all of that, but um, if they were to be aware of those things, they would they would have recognized that their du'a was answered beyond their wildest imagination. So just, you know, as a lesson for us of like, when we're making that du'a and we're feeling like it's not being answered, that sometimes we're being held back from things that we really don't want. Um, you know, I think all of us are converts, you know, we probably had like high school sweethearts or whatever that we're probably like, oh my gosh, I really want to marry them. And then like, we look back on it now and we're like, I'm so glad I didn't marry that person. Um, you know, whereas like in that process, we might've felt like, you know, my life is in shambles and whatever. But in the end, we're, uh, there's the one country song from like years ago that was like, uh, thank God for unanswered prayers. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily like an unanswered prayer. It's just that we didn't know what was best for ourselves. The law is the best plotter. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so many times I've seen this. Um, so these stories are a reminder of that. And I think if we're watchful in our own lives, we see that happening as well. Um, and then also seeing, I mean, just thinking of Mary's position in life, she had very little choice, right? She was, she lived in a temple that was chosen for her before she ever had the ability to make any choices for herself. So she, you know, it apparently accepted this and was okay with it. And then it's, we never hear of her making dua that she's going to get pregnant, right? So she, uh, she becomes pregnant uh, outside of her choosing to become pregnant. And she accepts this, she accepts it as a miracle. Um, we never hear about her complaining about this. Um, and then, you know, she has this, she has this baby that's also performing miracles. Like she is almost like a passenger in life throughout all of this. And not that we need to be, especially, you know, at least for myself, when I first came to Islam, I was like, oh, like I should be kind of like a conservative Christian. And like, in some of those circles, it means you're expected to be a doormat, right? Like you're expected to not have a strong personality. You're expected to not really make your opinions known. Um, and that doesn't really, that's not really true in Islam, um, but it takes some while, some time sometimes to like figure out religious life doesn't just look like this. Um, but for Mary, she really was just a passenger in life. She was just like a vehicle for like all these other miracles that we see. And she doesn't, other than this patience and perseverance that she has, she doesn't have anything remarkable that's just her own. And I think that, um, I think of my grandmother in the sense of like, she was like, she was a stay at home mom and then she was a seamstress. And then like, she quilted with people at church, right? Like she, she didn't have any high achievements. She wasn't known for being the best, whatever. But then when she died, like people came out of the woodwork to come to her funeral. It was like my uncle's ex-wife and her son from like a previous marriage, right? Like people who are not related to my grandmother by blood and they're now like separated by divorce uh, from my grandmother, they still came to the funeral. Like everybody came to the funeral because of the grace that she had because of how kind she was and caring you know she had nothing to really hold on to of her own except the relationship that she had with other people and that's kind of the key with mary as well is that it's her relationship with other people it's the answer dua of her parents and then it's the miraculous nature of her son that make her special um, and make her somebody that is remembered for like the rest of all time. So I think that um, especially moms who stay home with their kids and don't have like other stuff going on, they can kind of like lose this sense of self, 
later in life and that, like wonder what have I ever done? What it, like, what am I good for? That kind of thing. And sometimes, um, sometimes there's value in just being that person that's connected to the other people. Um, and, you know, each of us has our own personality. And I think my grandmother was really happy with that. I really hope and pray that Mary um, was really happy with her position in life. Um, but the high achieving, you know, that type of thing isn't the only way to be a God conscious person. And then the last thing. Good point, um, Good point Jenna. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Um, the last point that I wanted to talk about is just that truth overcomes falsehood in the end. So again, people were accusing her of being unchaste. They were accused, I mean, the rumor mill has existed since, you know, since there were probably five people on the planet, like so-and-so said so-and-so, did you hear so-and-so did so-and-so, such and such, right? Um, and of course, there's the Jewish community who does deny that she was chaste. Um, but by and large, right, like, by and large, the entire world recognizes um, that she was chaste, that this was a miraculous birth. Um, so the truth has come out. And it wasn't just in the Bible, it was in the Quran as well. So over and over, Allah is like recognizing the truth in this story. And so like, she doesn't even have to stand up for herself in like, uh, you know, she's not having to like stand up on a podium and like declare such and such and go to like some doctor, whatever, you know, things that people would go through. We, but there is a level of patience that we just have to sit through. Um, and I think that's a really good, personal trait that we can work on myself for sure included is just that patience like through the process of sometimes things just take time um and just recognizing even if people are talking bad about you or you know spreading lies about people that you love that you know we we try to correct that behavior whenever we can but we don't lose hope that like forevermore we're going to be thought of as whatever this falsehood is. And even if we had to deal with somebody making up lies about us and like, we go to our deathbed with people still thinking that stuff about us, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive, will reward us, I should say, we should, he will reward us for the patience that we have in that process and how we remain upright and we don't fall down to people's level and start passing around gossip or making up lies about other people in retaliation. So those are just some of the nuggets that I guess I was thinking about with uh, the story of Mary alayhi salam or radiallahu anha. Um, and so that is, that's everything. Do you guys have any comments on that? I do, um, you know, a lot to care of Mary. You know, um, if you have faith, um, you know, we have that faith that Allah is going to take care of us, even if things seem like they're not going in our favor. Time goes to show over and over again through all the stories that we know from Islam. Like Yusuf, you know, he was sold into slavery. And look, look at the outcome, you know. Prophet Muhammad was uh, kicked out of Taif. You know, they threw, they stoned him when he's and kicked him out. He, he's bleeding, chipped a tooth or whatever. And, all these stories, you know, it just goes to show, teach us that we need to have faith in Allah. And if we fulfill our obligations and we're sincere to Allah, we can have confidence that he's going to take care of us one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't always look the way that we think it's going to look, but it always turns out, um, it always turns out okay in the end, inshallah. Right. I will end with Surah Al-Asr. Um, Erica, that. you don't have anything to say? Um, I do not. I really enjoyed listening to it. Miriam is actually one of my favorite names um, in Islam. Um, so I, I really like that chapter too as well. And I like how it Islam doesn't deny the fact that Mary or Jesus did happen. It's just another view of it in Islam. So I like the connection part too. 
Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah, because even when I was pagan for like 10 years, and even in that time, um, everybody that I knew in those circles recognized that Jesus was at the very least a historical figure. Like you can't deny that he lived. Um, I think during that time, I didn't really hold a lot of opinion of his life or, you know, anything, really anything about him. I just didn't give it a lot of thought. Um, but yeah, to dismiss, to dismiss Isa alayhi salam is, um, you know, you just can't, you just, there's, you know, there's truth in his story, whether you choose to recognize it or not. And of course, you know, Islam is the truth. And so, you know, we're going to highlight the truth in that story and the things that we can learn from it. So I will end with Surah Al-Asr. Um, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنْسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرٍ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ. I will stop the recording.